Well, you're most welcome. It's Saturday evening, the 12th of June. Now, we're going to look at the myocarditis possible side effect. And there's going to be a meeting of the CDC in the United States on this uh, next week. So we're going to look at that in some detail. Before we do, if you live in the United Kingdom, the opening up on the 21st of June um, will almost certainly not be happening now. It's going to be delayed by probably four weeks. Now, I'm no, I don't think I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be because the Prime Minister says we'll need to be cautious and that's basically saying we're not going to open up on schedule. So we're not going back. Uh, we're just going to have a bit of a, of a delay where we are in the current stage, um, which, to be fair, isn't too onerous for, for most of us. And of course, it's due to the new variant primarily. Now, on to the main business for today. Um, this is the... Uh, meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunisation Practice. And this is going to be uh, Friday the 18th of June. And it's Atlanta, Georgia. Now, um, the significance of this, of course, is it's related to the side effect of the messenger ribonucleic acid vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. So let's look at that um, and unpack it a little, a little bit. A review of potential link between heart inflammation and mRNA vaccines. Direct quote from that uh, paper we've just seen, COVID-19, mRNA vaccines in adolescents and young adults benefit stroke risk discussion. So that makes perfect sense that this should happen. So CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunisation and Practice. Now, CDC identified 216 cases of heart inflammation after the first dose and 573 cases of heart inflammation after the second dose. So we can see here it's more common after the second dose. Sounds like quite a lot, but of course we've got to put this into context. And this is the data we have at the moment. That's from 172 million people vaccinated uh, with at least one shot. So 172 people, 172 million people vaccinated. Uh, a total of 789 adverse events. So that's that one and that one. So 789 adverse events. Now I get that to be, do the sum yourself, but you can see it's very infrequent. Uh, one in uh, over 200,000 vaccinations. Um, but it's still concerning and it still needs checked out. So that seems to be what we have at the moment. Now, if you want some details on this, um, there are plenty, actually, because this link here, that link there, um, basically, it's a PowerPoint that tells you all about it. So we'll just have a quick look at some of that now. Um, here we go. So that's on uh, this one. Uh, myocarditis and pericarditis following mRNA vaccination. And it gives a lot of information here. So here we see the uh, the vaccines. So Pfizer BioNTech, pericarditis, myocarditis or pericarditis reported after the first dose, and then reported after the second dose. So for the Pfizer after the first dose, one one six. We see it's more common after the second dose. The Moderna, again, we see it's more common after the second dose. So that there the figures two one six after the first dose, five seven three after the after after the second dose. So that's um. Uh, those figures. I, I mean, it gives you a lot more information. It breaks it down quite a lot. So uh, median age. Now, this is looking, th th this is skewed towards the younger age group, which is why it's a concern. Now, before we look at the age group, um, we can see that this is the male-female ratio after the first dose and the second dose. Um, so as we know, more common after the second dose. But if we look at the percentages rather than the numbers, uh, we see 65% um, 65 percent male 34 percent female and likewise there more males than females so this is more affecting young younger men um, now here's the symptoms here symptoms and diagnosis of preliminary myocarditis pericarditis and I'm going to stop giving you lots of detail in a minute because you can look at this for yourself but we see chest pain difficulty breathing and these are clinical findings that we'll have a quick look at and lots of uh, information there if you want to look at this further so um, 
everything seems pretty open, uh, pretty detailed information there, which of course is exactly what we like. We like as much transparency as possible. Now, um, looking at a cohort of under 30s here, uh, they found 475 people under the age of uh, 30 years or under. Now, the thing about this, if I just show you this, maybe one more slide here. Um, we see that we have 8.8% uh, .8 of doses administered in these younger age groups, but 52.5% 52, 52 of total reports. So we see that this is well skewed towards the uh, under uh, the lower age groups. But interestingly, we see it seems to be um, you know, 16. So it looks like less common in under under 15. So it's 16 to 24 year olds that seem to be mostly affected by this. Uh, slight uh, less so for 25 to 39, although there's still cases there. And then less common in the older, in the older age groups. This is all uh, just U.S. data, of course, from the uh, from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, now, just looking at a few figures here. Um, so, uh, 475 cases under the age of 30 or under that, that have been identified here. Now, they followed up 285 of these cases, so they know what happened to them. Of that 285, 15 still in hospital, three in intensive care, 270 discharged. So that's the outcome from that group there. Um, so we see it's the minority that are still hospitalised or were still in intensive care. Uh, the numbers we know about 180, 81% made a full recovery. And we believe it is 100% full recovery. 19% uh, ongoing signs of unknown known status, 41. So basically this is still being done. So we don't know what's happened to this or there's ongoing signs. Now this PowerPoint gives us uh, some ideas of how to recognise this condition. But of course, you go and see a doctor immediately anytime you thought anything was wrong. There's a couple important implications here. I'm just wondering sometimes if younger men might be statistically better to have uh, an adenovirus vector vaccine. I think that question needs to be answered. And I think it's very important to emphasise that if you've got any clinical features at all, you would rest until you got medical attention. You wouldn't exercise. And it may be advisable to exercise uh, to, to abstain from exercise for a time after vaccine anyway. That may change in the guidelines. It's not there yet. So looking at some of these clinical features as given to us on the site, uh, myocarditis in the over 12. Now, if you think of the, if you think, if you think, if you take a section of the heart, so on the outside, there's the, the pericardium there. That's the pericardium. And then in the missile, in the middle there, there's the muscle layer. So that, that's the muscle layer there underneath the pericardium. The pericardium has got a tough fibrous outer coat. And on the inside, it's the endocardium. So this is inflammation of the pericardium, pericarditis, or inflammation of the myocardium, the middle layer. So this is talking about myocarditis in over 12s, inflammation of this middle layer of the heart here. Vital, of course, because that's the pumping muscle of the heart. That's quite essential, obviously. The whole heart's essential. Right, presence of one, new or worsening symptoms, chest pain or uh, pressure, chest pain or pressure or discomfort in the chest, either of those. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, pain with breathing, or palpitations. They're, they're the three that they mention. Palpitations are awareness of one's own heartbeat. You can sometimes feel the heart beating inside the chest. And then when uh, examination, ECG changes or EKG is more common in the States. Um, it's the same. It's exactly the same thing, electrocardiogram. Troponins are, troponins are um, chemicals released by damaged myocardium. So if, the, if an area of myocardium is damaged, it will release these troponins. You detect the troponins in the blood and that's a marker of cardiac damage and abnormal, abnormal cardiac function with, with testing. So... Again, these tests can be uh, the, 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 these tests can be done, but they're the clinical features that people might recognise, and of course would want to seek immediate medical uh, advice. Now, pericarditis, um, the features there are described as acute chest pain, pericardial rub is something that a doctor would listen to with a stethoscope, but they would hear that, a new ST elevation or PR depression. So this is to do with the, the ECG. So um, 
So what you have in an ECG is you have a P. Uh, then you, know, you have a Q, R, S, and then a T wave like that. So that that's that's the that, that's kind of a normal ECG. Well, <laughs> roughly normal. P, Q, R. S and T. So the two things to look out for, it says here, are, are PR depression. So between the P and the R wave, that wave would uh, that would sag down a bit, or ST depression would be that bit would be higher than it's supposed to be there. Um, th th this could indicate perhaps problems with the top part of the heart, the, the atrium. This could indicate problems with the bottom part of the heart, the ventricles. But th 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 these are well known in, in clinical in clinical circles. Um, so th th those those ECG changes that the doctor would recognise, or uh, new or worsening pericardial effusion. So what what you have is that the pericardium is like a sac that goes all around the heart like that. It's a fibrous sac, and then the heart is in the middle of that there, pumping away. And of course, there's nice lubrication in between, but there's only supposed to be a very thin layer of lubrication. Now, if you get fluid in there, fluid collecting in there, that's called a pericardial effusion. And of course, if there's fluid all around, I think you can see what that would do is, is put pressure on the heart. That's called cardiac tamponade. So again, that, that, that would require immediate specialist uh, consultant medical attention if that was happening. So th they're, the things, they're the things to look out for. But um, ju just remember how infrequent these were. The, the initial figures show that it's um, less than one in 200,000. And with most patients doing well, providing they get good medical attention. So um, the implications of this um, guidelines may change to, to make people much more aware of this. Guidelines may change uh, to potentially advise people to take some rest after the vaccine. Certainly, people should have a high index of suspicion for anything wrong and seek immediate medical advice after vaccination. And th there may be a case for thinking about giving young men an alternative vaccine. Now, that's not happening. It's all been done by age as opposed to sex at the moment. But there's some quite serious implications there. So we, we, we see this is um, approximately what, what one in 200,000, but, but more, more common in, in the younger age group, which, of course, is the concern, uh, primarily in the, in the younger age group, where 8.8% of doses, but 52.5% of cases. Uh, and of course, other vaccines are going to be along soon to, to give us a wider choice. Is it the Novavax, I think, which, for example, is, is, is a protein based um, is a protein based vaccine, which may become appropriate. Anyway, in the meantime, that meeting's happening. Um, CDC safety expert Tom, I uh, can't pronounce that, sorry. Direct quotes, we're still learning about the rates of myocarditis and pericarditis. As we gather more information, we'll begin to get a better idea of the post-vaccination rates and hopefully be able to get more detailed information by age group and hopefully, I would add, by, by sex as well. So that's kind of roughly where we are with that and um, we'll know more after that meeting next week. Now, some interesting information coming out of the G7 meeting in uh, Cornwall. Uh, for example, there's going to be a joint declaration, we believe, to prepare for the next pandemic. And part of the criteria, criteria there will be that they will have a facility which will allow a vaccine to be developed against a new virus in 100 days. That would be really quite, uh, quite incredible. Uh, so, and, and more to come on that preparedness for a new pandemic. I think people have finally learned the uh, dangers of, of pandemics. And of course, the next one could be much more virulent than this one. That is for sure. A couple of the things there. Mr. Biden, President Biden, uh, confirmed 500 million doses of Pfizer, as we said a couple of days ago. We knew that was coming uh, to be supplied to 92 lower middle income countries and the African Union. So that's good news. And it's going to be manufactured from August. So it's the end of the year into next year. Mr. Biden, direct quotes, President Biden, uh, the United States is providing these half billion doses with no strings attached. Our vaccine donations don't include pressure or pressure for favours or potential concessions. We're doing this to save lives. Just it's almost as if he's thinking that other people don't have such pure motives. Um, but that's their, their direct quotes make of those what you want. 
Now, the other G7 countries are giving another 500 million. That's a billion altogether. UK is giving 100 million. Five million doses by the end of September from the UK. So this is a billion doses coming from the uh, G7 meeting. So that's quite productive. And uh, this is not so. So now we've got Russian vaccine, Chinese vaccine and now G7 vaccine going out in, in large amounts globally. So it is encouraging. Um, is it going to be enough? Well, probably not. We still need more diffuse domestic vaccine production. Uh, 25 more million doses from the UK by the end of the year. Now, fe 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 federal regulators, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so they've extended the storage time by six weeks. It's from three months up to four and a half months. But it still looks like 60 million doses need to be discarded because of a threat, I believe, a threat of contamination with... Um, as I, as I read this, they think it, some, some of the doses might be contaminated with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, this is the plant in Baltimore that seems to have been troubled. Now, where the contamination with um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine would be dangerous or not, I've, I have no idea. But they seem to have been discharg discarding 60 million doses, which is a bit of a tragedy, really. And this has got quite big implications for South Africa. So... Um, Probably more to come on that. Um, it's it's been a bit disappointing so far. As far as I know, the Baltimore production is is uh, suspended at the moment. So hopefully that will come back online soon because the um, the big advantage of this, of course, is it's a single dose vaccine. Now, lots of questions. People have asked me lots of questions about the situation in Chile. Um, how come uh, vaccinations are high and cases are also high? So let's look at that now. Um, Chile population 90 million. Santiago is actually in full lockdown from today. Um, fully vaccinated though in Chile 58%, at least one dose 75%, but they've had lots, lots of new cases. So quite what is going on because hospitals are reported to be crowded and intensive care units in Santiago are at 98%. In fact, they're basically full. Uh, this Yossi this, uh, Lewis, this chap, um, Chile's National Federation of Nursing Association members are on the verge of collapse so the nurses have had it hard for a long time very hard for a long period of time and they seem to be really suffering and of course the doctors will be exactly the same now the vaccine there is mostly uh, Chinese made Coronavac 20 million doses of vaccine have been administered in Chile most of them, nearly 16 million have been the Chinese Coronavac 3.6 million Pfizer and a few Oxford AstraZeneca Health Ministry Wednesday and Thursday, 27% of cases were in fully vaccinated people. So two things there. This is talking about cases, not people that are sick. And we know that the probability from quite a few studies of the coronavac at preventing symptomatic disease is less than it is for these other vaccines. So some of these cases maybe had the coronavac, which is not preventing cases as much. That could be part of it because that was the majority vaccine. I'm going to give you some evidence of that in a minute. 74% were under the age of 49. So a lot of cases in younger people, uh, that's overall. So again, we see in the unvaccinated, the most cases are still in the unvaccinated, implying there is some protection from the vaccines. Now, April uh, University of Chile, Coronavac, 56% effective two weeks after the second dose, uh, preventing symptomatic disease. So that is the level of protection, which is lower. But of course, as always, there's other factors involved. Chile's, there's been a protest about lockdowns because people can't make a living. Pandemic fatigue, travel variations are also a factor. Now, the World Health Organization, 1st of June, approved Coronavac at 51% efficacy in preventing, um, preventing um, symptomatic disease. We had a kind of a rule of thumb at the beginning of this that anything over over 50% was worth having. So 51% is still worth having. Um, and that was late stale trial data. So we've got efficacy at preventing symptomatic disease of 51 to 56%. Uh, I think that was based on, yeah, that study was healthcare workers in Brazil, but, and it's a massive but, 100% effective at preventing severe disease and death. So even though it's not preventing as many symptomatic cases, there can be symptomatic cases, 
but we must assume that the people that are being hospitalised and going into intensive care are in the unvaccinated group. That's what makes sense. So we see all of the vaccines that we know of are preventing people from getting serious illness and, and uh, death. Now, in a whole population, of course, there's going to be a few cases of serious illness. There's even going to be a few deaths, but it's going to be massively, massively, massively less. So I think that's what's happening. Cases, yes, because you're still getting symptomatic cases after two doses of the vaccine, particularly with the coronavac. But the severe cases in hospital are mostly people that are unvaccinated, mostly. Now, I don't know that for sure. We haven't got full data yet from from Chile, but that is what makes that, that that's what makes sense to me at the moment. So that's my answer to that question. Six hundred million doses have been delivered to Chile. So that study was in Brazil. Everything else we talked about is Chile. Uh, Sinopharm efficacy is seventy nine percent against symptomatic disease. So it's strange that the, the two Chinese vaccines, that the CoronaVac and the the Sinopharm. Uh, they are both uh, basically killed virus. That they are whole viral particles killed, and um, given the similarities in them, it does seem strange that there's this difference, apparent difference in protection against symptomatic disease. But we, we believe they all have great levels of protection against serious disease, seen at serious illness and death. Therefore, are good as long as the side effect profile is acceptable. Now. We started this video with the uh, the Delta var uh, the, the the Delta variant delaying our full reopening in the UK or at least in England and England at least from the twenty first of June back to the twenty first of July almost certainly. Um, let's just look at the um, some other factors here. This is quite interesting. Now uh, um, th th this is directly from this uh, Public Health England website here. So just to highlight a couple of things without going into too much detail. Transmissibility between humans, that they, there is high confidence that transmissibility appears to be greater than the first wave. And we believe 60% more transmissible than the uh, B117 Alpha uh, Kent variant. Delta cases are rising whilst Alpha cases are declining. So more information there if you want it. Now, infection severity. Now, increased severity hospitalisation risk compared to the Alpha variant. So what they're saying here is the Delta India variant is causing more serious disease than the Alpha Kent UK variant. But they have a low um, confidence of that. It may be the case. So this they're pretty sure about, the high transmissibility they're sure. The more severe disease, it's low confidence. Uh, immunity after natural infection. Uh, experimental evidence of functional evasion of natural immunity, but insufficient epidemiological data. So they're not sure about that one. Um, epidemiological and laboratory evidence of reduced vaccine efficacy. So we know there is reduced vaccine efficacy. We've looked at this, but it's still massively better than no vaccine. So it's good the way that they're giving this information and saying how sure they are, uh, how confident they are that this information is correct. And then they, they give a, a review here. Delta variant is uh, is predominant and all analysis finds that it has a very substantial growth advantage. So that is clear and there's more details there. Just click on that link there if you'd like to check and make sure I'm not getting this wrong. OK, so um, that is us for today. I don't know quite how to summarise that. Um, more information on myocarditis next week. I mean, we did suspect this as a side effect because of the Israeli data quite some time ago, so that would be clarified. I mean, I think the key thing with these side effects is that people need to know they can occur. They need to know they're rare. It needs to inform national vaccine policy in terms of age group and sex, which, which will be happening. And also people need to be aware that if there are any side effects, go and get immediate uh, health care uh, advice, of course. So that is us for today. Thank you for watching.